Hello, everyone. Welcome to week 14 of assessment. Um, we are talking today about what to do with your formative assessment results. Um, if these, um, these questions that you sent out um, had been given in your class to your students, what would you do with them? Um, so our agenda for today is I'm going to talk you through that process and then show you an example. And um, that will be the majority of our time together. And then we'll finish up with what's due for the remainder of the semester. So jumping right in um, to your uh, formative assessment analysis. Um, hopefully before you viewed this video, you read through um, the assignment specifications as well as at least one of those exemplars to get um, familiar with what we're doing. I'm now going to try to talk you through it in a more step-by-step -step fashion. Um, we started at the very, very beginning of the semester. Before we knew that this is where we were going to end up, we talked, um, this was actually an online video that I showed you um, that first week of class. And I showed you this about the role of feedback, a reminder that effect sizes um, uh, for Hattie, he has a pretty high bar for what he considers to be effective interventions in school. Um, he says if we can find that something has an effect size um, of even like 0.15, we have to check, chalk that up to developmental effects. Like it just is something that came from um, growing as a, as a student, as a, you know, as a human being. Um, and, and we can't necessarily chalk it up to teaching. Um, if effect sizes are between 0.5, um, sorry, 1.15 and 0.4, then he says, well, in that area, we can start to see, say that, yeah, the teacher had something to do with it. But what he says is if we really want something to, um, something to have the bang for the buck that we want it to have, we want it to be 0.4 and above. That's what we're shooting for with anything we decide to do. And so here's a little preview into your readings for next week. He has found in his meta-analysis, which is doing like a meta-analysis of other meta-analyses. In a meta-analysis, you can have like 800 studies, like looking at 800. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, what he has found by looking at um, research worldwide, not just in the United States, that homework has a 0.9 effect right here. Um, is where it, th this arrow is. And so um, not necessarily something that's up in this high area, um, that, that it doesn't necessarily help all students. If we have things in this area, then we know that we're helping all students grow. So what we can find are the, some things that are 0.4, oops, 0.4 and above, um, are the things that are listed on this chart. Um, small group learning with appropriate materials and tasks. We've done some of that this year. Goals, problem solving, using varied teaching strategies, collaborative learning. But look at this, the things that are in the winner category that are like all the way up here, like the arrows up here, um, is providing formative evaluation and providing feedback in response to that formative evaluation. And then look at that. Student-teacher relationships, 0.72. Um, so we're going to really, that's what we're focusing on today, is you uh, do conducting some formative evaluation and providing effective feedback. I want you to pause um, and study pages 110 and 111, This is specifically the chart on page 111 of your um, Designing Authentic Tasks and Performance texts, um, the McTidy Bay and Carbaugh texts that you um, have the hard copy of. What do you believe is the most important point that emerges on page 110? And then what do you think is the most helpful example from the chart on page 111? I'm going to ask you to pause and think about that. And we'll talk about this um, in our meeting. Welcome back. I look forward to hearing what you think when we get together on Zoom in a little bit. Um, Hopefully, uh, really just to kind of sum up, effective feedback is specific and descriptive. It's goal specific, targeted on the goal that you want students to achieve. It's user friendly. It's guided by clear criteria. It's timely and it's actionable. Remember that feedback is not the same thing as advice or evaluation. So keeping that in mind, looking at this example from page um, 111, 
um, we can look and ask ourselves how well do those examples meet up, match up with this task with these, sorry, with these criteria. You can look at that even in your book since they are facing pages, I believe. Oh, sorry, yawning. Um, so here are the examples of effective feedback, hopefully that meet, match up with those criteria. So these are the things that we wanna be able to say to students, whether that's in the form of a task card, whether that's written feedback or whether, whether that's through a conference, um, either individual or small group. So once we've gathered appropriate um, information about student learning, then we know what to say in the feedback. It's hard to know if you don't have any evidence in front of you, but you should have some evidence in front of you now. Um, and so now we can better tell what kind of feedback to provide. So get your assessment results out, those gathered from your um, test questions, and have that display up so you can um, toggle back and forth between the video and your results. Um, this is in essence what we're doing, although we're doing digitally. This is a, I was working with at uh, Rockingham County Middle School. This week, this was a teacher's, um, her formative assessment, um, really a routine. It's a, an example from, oh, sorry, a differentiation book. Um, and so she, um, wow, I need some more coffee. I am so sorry. Um, so anyway, she did this often. It became a routine. Um, and then she has right here, she sorted her results into piles and this group needs something specific, this group needs something specific, and this group needs something specific. Now it's important to note that when she worked with these small groups, she didn't necessarily have them all together. Like she paired, look, went through the stack, um, it was this stack actually, and put them in pairs um, and had them just work in pairs. I think they were in a small group and I think there were only four here. So they were in a small group together, but this was the biggest group. So she broke them into pairs and had them, but they all worked on the same thing. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at your assessment things and you're going to, even though you can't physically put them in piles, you're going to kind of put them in groups and think about those results as being in groups and what patterns you find. So examine your assessment results and try to find patterns among the assessment results. Um, it is okay for you to focus on one question. It might be that your short answer question gave you all the information you need and the other two are just noise, then just focus on that question. It might be that your true false question with the explanation re revealed more than anything else, or the combination of the true false and the multiple choice revealed something. You can focus on one question, you can focus on two questions, or you can focus on the entire assessment. It's up to you. But you're going to try to find patterns. The first pattern you're looking is if there's something everyone needs. You might look through and go, gosh, nobody or almost like there was only one student or two students who talked about blah, blah, blah. And that's very important. So that would be your review, your warm up, or a mini lesson that everyone would get. Um, don't need to put kids in small groups based on something everybody needs. The most uh, efficient delivery of instruction that everybody needs is whole group, and that's okay. Next, you're gonna form groups according to the different patterns that you discern. So that's what I want you to do is look through and see, decide which question or questions you're gonna focus on and see if you can find some patterns. For your own clarity, once you've found those patterns, define those groups in some way. So like they all have the misconception that blah, 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 or they correctly described this, but missed this point. Um, or they all understood exactly what I was asking. They're ready to apply it to a more complicated problem or text. Um, so that is the kind of thing you're looking for. And I would have some sticky notes or something to write on um, to think about that. And I would expect you to pause at this point and try to go through and, and see if you can find some patterns and what then name those patterns in some way. Oops. Okay, once you have ended, if you have paused, that's great. Um, I hope you did. Um, if you're still waiting for your assessment results are, to come in, then you can come back and play this this later and pause and do that. Now, for your own clarity, identify some uh, representative responses for each group. So if you said that this group um, really got it and they're ready to move on to a more complex text or problem, then you would give me a sample answer there. Um, if it was a graph, then you would just describe what they did on the graph. Um, 
than the group that like they got this, but they didn't they didn't make the connection to this. And then there might be some that like they just didn't meet any of the learning goals. Um, but be don't say high, medium, and low. Try to be more um, specific than that. And you pull out some sample examples, sample sample answers, and then then you start thinking about what might each group need to take their next step. So that is what we're moving to for part two. So I would say pause here have this stuff kind of like solidified in your mind. And now we're going to think about this in stage two in that, sorry, in the next step in part two of the formative assessment analysis. So in part two, figure out what feedback and practice or extension each group would need to address their misconceptions if they had some, help them move to the next level of sophistication, especially that top group maybe that really showed some uh, cohesive understanding. Um, what authentic task could you move them to next? What more complex text or problem could you ask them to grapple with? Keep in mind that good feedback provides both glow and grow information. It's specific and descriptive. It's actionable and it's goal and learning goal oriented and it's user friendly. Like you're not writing necessarily to like feedback is something that should be understood by middle or high school students. This is a, some, like a little bit of a summary, a con condensation of that bigger list that we saw in another slide. So I want you to think about that and make some notes to yourself. Pause and go ahead and do that. Welcome back from pausing. Um, now that you've thought about it, I want you to devise and record a small group activity, record meaning write it down or type it up, um, a small group activity for each group that will correct their misconceptions a pro provide appropriate feedback and help them achieve the same learning goals with the appropriate degree of support and challenge. I'm going to encourage you to start with, I'm actually going to ask you and to require you to start with the top task first. There is so much magic in this little piece of advice. Um, it changed the way I thought about structuring tasks as a teacher. Um, when you look at the group that has is ready to take the next step, it's kind of where you thought everybody would be. You design that for them. And then you get to the next group and you're like, how could I help them approximate doing that, but with some additional scaffolding, maybe some, some prompting questions or an example or a simplified scenario. Um, and then you get to, and you just, you do that um, as you go for each group. Now it's okay, again, I'm gonna go back here. Sorry for the, um, oh geez, I'm gonna have to. It's okay if you have one group that's much bigger than the other two. Um, I wouldn't have more than five different levels. I think that that's when you start your, your splitting hairs. Um, you don't necessarily wanna say, you know, for instance, in math, if they're making all the same calculation error um, and you, that's what you made your groups based on, you might have seven or eight groups because um, there's so many places they could go wrong. It's better to be like, you know, there was one error, there were multiple errors, or there were, you know, like they were making one of these two specific errors. Um, and so you might have a few in one group, a bunch in another group, and a handful in another group. Um, and then you would just subdivide from there. But just right now, we're just thinking about what those tasks would be, not who you're going to put into a group with whom, since we're not actually doing that at this point. You don't have them in class. Okay, pay no attention to the uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that is, um, you're starting with the top task first, and then you are scaffolding up, adding, adding support to help them get there. I want to give you an example of this, just so you can see what I'm talking about. I know you've read um, a math example or a humanities example. Um, but here are some history UKDs um, that this teacher was using. This is in a high school class. Um, and so this was the formative assessment. This wasn't for all of these UKDs, but just focusing on part of it, um, this teacher wanted to make sure that kids got this because he didn't think he could move he could move on until everybody got it. So we asked them to name three factors that threatened the US policy of isolation and uh, isolationism in World War II, but it had to be prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And then explain whether you believe the US policy of isolationism would or would not have continued if the Japanese had not attacked Pearl Harbor. Refer to the factors you listed up here in question one in your response. 
Okay, so that was those were his two very meaty questions. And he used the answers, the results from both of those to form his groups. Um, he had some students, his three groups were students, the top group was students who clearly, reasonably, and thoroughly defended their answer. Um, number two on this card, pulling in some of these important um, factors. And so they were, they were like ready, like they were ready to argue. And so he paired those students um, who had similar answers on their exit cards with, um, he paired them up and he had them engage in a structured academic controversy um, to argue both for and against their original position. Um, we were gonna do one of those about grades. We're not gonna be able to do that, but I'll post the steps to it. This is a, this could be a routine in a history classroom. Um, a structured academic controversy, you argue one side of the issue very vehemently, and then you have to switch sides and, and, and then you listen to the other people get, you know, give the opposing side and you take notes, and then you actually have to flip sides and argue the other side of the question just as vehemently. So they were doing that. They knew how to do that already. The teacher didn't have to teach them how to do a structured academic controversy. That was routine in the class. Um, the teacher was circulating through the whole class and monitoring um, and their directions once they finished the structured academic controversy was to compose a joint this we believe statement about the u.s involvement in world war ii and they had to make sure that they pulled in each viewpoint represented um, in that that was pulled out for the uh, academic controversy key evidence and logic um, for their perspective about the ability of the U.S. to exist in an isolationist state, both in the past and the present. I wanted to think about present as well. So that's what the kids who really got it were able to do um, to stretch them further and to think um, about an other side of the issue that maybe they hadn't thought about before. The students, um, there, he had another group of students, and this was the largest group, um, who had difficulty defending their opinion about continued U.S. isolationism. So he had them review their exit card responses from the previous day, grab their um, their articles, their sources, go on um, Google Classroom um, and find some resources to help them add fuel to the fire of their arguments because their arguments were too um, spare. They didn't really make a point. Um, he, so yeah, he had key pages and, and websites for them to, re to refer to. And they, he checked in, the teacher checked in to see their progress. And then the teams work together to compose a, this we believe statement um, the same as the previous group did. Um, key evidence and logic to defend their perspective about the US um, and how able it would be have been to exist in an isolationist state both then and now. Um, and so they basically ended up doing the same product, but they spent more time individually reviewing and adding um, fuel to the fire because that's the feedback they needed. He's like, hey guys, you've got a great start here, but you didn't convince me. I need to see more evidence. So check through these resources. And once he saw that they had some good opinions, then he put them together um, to work on that this we believe statement. Then he had a handful of students. So they were working in pairs. There were there, I think there were four, four of the four or five of the students that did the biggest. The, the highest task, the structured academic controversy. Okay, so then he had um, a handful of students, I think it was five or six, who had difficulty formulating a reasoned response. Um, they may or may not have had accurate facts in the answer, um, but they definitely couldn't um, argue for or against. So they began working by viewing a video that the teacher had bookmarked. Um, and at the video's completion, they selected a graphic organizer. Um, he has a, had a lot of those um, like in resource files in, in Google. So they um, like did a cause and effect chain or they could do a, you know, Venn diagram. They just, they chose a graphic organizer to try to get down the ideas that they saw in the video. And he checked in to see if they got it. And then they worked together. He sat with them and had like, what did you say? What did you say? What did you say? And he helped them craft a this we believe statement. So everybody ended up with a this we believe statement. It's just that they were supported and challenged um, in different ways to get there. Um, the top group um, was pushed to really think beyond their initial perception. Um, the group that just needed more evidence, was asked to gather more evidence. 
Um, and the group that had difficulty coming up with a response was supported and being able to formulate that and then to rely on each other and the teacher to create that, this we believe statement. But at the end of the day, they all went around and looked at their this we believe statements, which made it very respectful. That was the closure for the day is the sharing of this we believe statements and finding that there were in many cases they had similar things on their sheets, even though they worked in different groups. So that is an example um, of a formative assessment analysis. And again, um, what, like I, I want, I'm hoping that you paused while you did this and took some notes and um, made some, some, you know, sketched out some ideas um, of what might happen with your results. Uh, again, you can focus on one question, two questions, or all three, whichever makes the clearest, um, whichever gives you the clearest patterns. Um, so what's due? Um, I have some grading and homework articles on Canvas that I'm going to ask you to um, read and interact with. with you, know, you are going to, um, so that that's going to, you need to be ready with that for next week. Um, that's going to be our last thing. I'm going to present you with a, a set of grading criteria and ask you to evaluate it based on what you read about grading and homework in the articles that are posted. Um, and then do before next class, you should have, before this class, you should have turned in your stage three um, draft and I'll be working on giving you feedback before next week. Um, and then do before class next week is a draft of your formative assessment for peer editing. I'll give you a place to post that in, on Canvas and assign you a peer editor. Um, and then during class next week, we'll do the Padlet post on the grading videos. Um, and then your um, formative analysis, the final form um, is due on Canvas Friday at four, uh, Friday the 24th at 5 p.m. Um, so we will be asking questions, like we'll really be talking about that in depth. If you need more time, if people are stressed out by that, I can give you some more time. Um, that's what it's looking at right now. And then your final um, must be submitted by May 6th at 5 p.m. That's really late, um, but that's what it said on the syllabus. That's what we're going to do. Um, so you'll need your final alignment guide, your revised stage one and two with your rubric and student friendly directions, um, your revised stage three with all supplementary formative assessment materials. And then I'm going to ask you to try to limit your submission to one document if possible. And if you can't, just use as few documents as possible. Um, delete portions you don't need. So if you ended up doing a grasp, you can delete the PBL outline. If you did the PBL outline, you know, plug the grasp into your situation or just get rid of the grasp altogether. Um, so your final is due May 6th. Um, but let's go back to this. Read for next time, read and interact with formative assessment articles on Canvas. Um, the Padlet's post is basically due like during class, like I'm going to ask you to pause and post. Um, but you will need a draft turned in for peer editing. And then your final will be due on Canvas um, on this day. I can move it to Monday, but I feel like everything in your life is due on Monday. So um, I just want to make sure it, it's doable for you. All right. I hope that you've got some notes jotted down and I hope you have some questions for me and we will I'll see you um, online here um, in a few minutes or if, if you're watching this on Tuesday, then I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you Wednesday um, at our usual time, 10 a.m. Um, to talk about all of this good stuff. Thank you.